<clears throat> well, uh, yeah, my name's JR, and I pastor a church in Grapevine. I'm married to Ginger, spice of my life, and uh, we have three kids, four kids. I keep forgetting. Uh, we've got an 18-year-old uh, girl, 14-year-old boy, a 9-year-old girl, and a 1-year-old boy. And uh, yeah, someone whistled. Um, you should have heard me when I found out. It was uh, quite a surprise. I tell people all the time when my oldest graduates high school, my youngest will be in diapers. And when my youngest graduates high school, I'll be in diapers. That's probably how it's going to work out. But anyway, I, I'm really grateful to get to be here. And uh, if you got a Bible, turn to John 21. I just want to chat a little bit this morning um, about the primacy of love. So turn there, John 21. So let me just kind of set the context for you. Um, John 21, I will begin in verse, uh, in verse 9. Uh, <clears throat> if you remember the story, this is after Jesus' resurrection. Peter and the disciples, some of the disciples decide to go fishing. And when they do, Jesus reveals himself. He's on the, he's on the shore there, and he reveals himself to these disciples, and and. They catch this big, large fish at Jesus' command to throw the net on one particular side of the boat. Peter realizes who this is. He throws off his outer garment. He plunges in, um, or he, he, he puts on uh, his garment, plunges into the, into the um, Sea of Galilee, and then swims towards Jesus, leaving the other disciples the job of dragging all the net full of fish to the, to the shore. And then in verse 9, uh, we pick it up here. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying in it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. Now, this was the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When Jesus had eaten breakfast, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told them. The second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told them. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, he told him, follow me. So Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them, the one who had leaned against Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, who is the one that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? If I want him to remain until I come, Jesus answered, what is that to you? As for you, you follow me. So this rumor spread that the brother, uh, to the brothers and sisters that this disciple would not die, yet Jesus did not tell him that he would not die, but if I want him to remain until I come, what is it to you? Well, I want to just say a few things from this passage, and hopefully it'll foster some good discussion with you, but um, it's it's really interesting to see Peter being restored here. Uh, I think some of the details of the story are pretty remarkable. There's a charcoal fire. The last time you saw a charcoal fire in John's Gospel, it was Peter standing around it and in discussions with people denying that Jesus was he, that he was a follower of Jesus. And so I think it's really interesting that Jesus kind of resets the scene and says, look, Peter, last time you were in a charcoal fire, you blew it. So I'm going to build another charcoal fire, and we're, we're going to have another go at it here. And Jesus enters a dialogue with him and asks him three times, do you love him? So here's the first thing I want you to see when it comes to your ministries and, and just our lives in general, is this Jesus is primarily concerned with our love for him even more than our usefulness to him. I, 
I think this is really important. Jesus is primarily concerned with our love for him, even more than our usefulness to him. Now, if you are in ministry, you're pursuing ministry leadership, there is a, a constant temptation and pressure to focus on our own usefulness, to focus on our success, our growth, our visibility, um, the success of our ministries, the fruitfulness of our ministries. And it's actually possible to give ourselves to the ministry while we're not giving ourselves fully to Jesus. And Jesus is primarily concerned with Peter's love for him. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that when you look at Peter's denial and you look at Peter's restoration, Jesus goes to the heart of the matter. He doesn't tell Peter, Peter, are you ready to be faithful to me? Peter, are you ready to be courageous? Peter, are you ready to be bold? He doesn't say any of that. He says, Peter, do you love me? Because Peter's denial was not an issue of cowardice. It was an issue of lovelessness. The reason that he denied Jesus is because of a lack of true, deep, abiding love for Jesus. But in that moment, what he loved more was his own skin and his own neck than he loved his Savior. And so Jesus goes to the heart of the matter. He says, Peter, here, let's get just ground floor. Here's what the most important thing is, is that you would truly love me. That you would have a deep devotion to me. Instead of focusing on the success of our ministry, the most important thing you could focus on is your own intimacy and your own love for Jesus. I think it's interesting in Luke 10 we see the same thing where Jesus sends out some disciples and they go out and he gives them authority to cast out demons. And they have this amazing ministry success. They come back, they proclaim the kingdom, they perform miracles, they cast out demons, and they come rejoicing and they say, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us. And Jesus says, um, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Remember this in Luke 10? And then he says this, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then he says, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, a lot of, a lot of scholars and commentators think that the reason Jesus refers to Satan falling like lightning from heaven was Jesus was warning them against pride in ministry success. Because here was Satan who had this privileged position in heaven, had an exalted place as, a glor as this glorious angel, and, but he grew prideful and he fell from heaven. Revelation 12 talks about this great uh, rebellion that he rose up and didn't, didn't maintain his place. And so in a sense, Jesus is warning them against ministry success. He says, look, you've had a lot of success, but I want to caution you about glorying in your success. I want to caution you about finding your primary joy in the fruits of your ministry. So he warns them. And he says, don't rejoice that you're, that the demons are subject to you, but here's the thing I want you to rejoice in most. Your names are written in heaven. Rejoice in this, that God knows you and that he loves you. At our church, we talk a lot about ordering our love, but we also have to order your joys. And make sure that the primary joy you find in your life is not necessarily the success and fruits of your ministry, but the fact that God knows you, that he loves you, that he's called you to himself, that he's written your name in heaven, that, he, that God's Son has brought you into the family of God, that Christ is yours and you are, you, you are Christ's. That that's the thing to rejoice in. That's the joy we need to order. And so we want to be careful that our, our primary joy is found in our relationship with God, not in our usefulness to God. Now, just a quick test. How do you know if you've put usefulness to God before your relationship with God or your love for God? Let me just give you a twofold test. Number one is this. When you spend time in the Scripture, and this is really relevant to those of you who teach the Bible in any capacity whatsoever, but is time in the Word viewed through the eyes of a Bible teacher, or is it viewed through the eyes of a sinner in need of grace? child in need of one's father. So if you can get into the scripture and all you see are sermon outlines and all you see are teaching points and all you see are ideas of things that you can communicate to other people versus seeing your savior and seeing your own sin and, and being humbled and seeing the love of a father and seeing the greatness of God and the glory of God and the beauty of God. And so I'm cautioning about what do you see in Scripture and what moves you in Scripture. So one of the indications that we have put usefulness 
for God before intimacy with God is that we end up looking at the Scripture through the lens of a teacher instead of looking at the Scripture through the lens of a, of a sinner in need of grace, a child in need of our Father. And here's the second thing. When you've put usefulness to God before intimacy with God, it, it, you have to listen to your prayers. Prayers become light on adoration and confession. I know this, that when, I've, when I'm thinking primarily about my usefulness to God, I find that my prayers are light on the adoration of God and light on confession of my sins against God. If I'm praying prayers of adoration and I'm dealing with, with I'm dealing with my own sin and I'm confessing my sins before God, that's a good indication that what's become primary to me is my relationship with God. But if I start focusing my prayer mainly on interceding over issues in the ministry or help with this or help with that, which all those things are great. We should intercede to God for those. But I know that I've skewed things when that becomes the bulk of my praying. So, this is the, this is the point of, of John 21 so far, is that we want to share Jesus' concern. And he's concerned primarily with our relationship with him rather than our usefulness to him. Now, this is what will sustain your ministry. I tell folks all the time, don't look to the fruits of your ministry to sustain your ministry. It just won't happen. There's going to be times in your ministry, like in Luke 10, where you come back rejoicing, and other times where you feel like you just got your ribs kicked in, right? Anyone ever been there? And so if you're looking at the fruits of your ministry to sustain the motivation of your ministry, your ministry is just going to be up and down, up and down, up and down. But if you will look to your love for the Lord Jesus and his love for you, if you will look to the fact that God knows you and has written your name in heaven and let that fuel and motivate your ministry, it will sustain you during times, listen, of barrenness. Because our ministries are not always going to be fruitful. Our ministries are not always going to be victorious. There are going to be times when we go through the wilderness, we go through dry seasons, we go through seasons of ineffectiveness and, and seasons where it just seems barren and unfruitful. And if you're looking to the fruits of your ministry to sustain your ministry, you will quit. You will grow weary. You'll grow tired. You have to. Jesus says, if you love me, here's what I want you to do. Feed my sheep. So he's saying to, to Peter, put your relationship with me primary because that's what's going to fuel your, your, your ministry. You will feed the sheep when you love your shepherd. You, it's not that I'm feeding the sheep because they love what I'm feeding them. And they voice their appreciation, right? He's saying, look, I want you to love me. And only when you love me rightly can you actually continue to persevere in the things that fall to you. So I would just want to challenge you to cultivate a devotional life with God. Um, that may sound like just basic 101. I tell our folks at Church of the Cross all the time, if you're a Christian, you should read the Bible every day. That's not legalism, that's discipleship. Read the Word every day. Spend time with God every day. If you do not plan this into your life, everything else will plan it out of your life. Can I get some help, right? If you don't plan time with God into your life, everything else is going to plan time with God out of your life. And so you have to have some no compromise times and places where you just choose to meet with God. For me, I have to do that before anyone else wakes up in my house. Because the minute everyone else wakes up in my house, I have demands placed upon me. And so I get up every morning at around 5.30, and I make a cup of coffee, a pot of coffee, and I I just get into the Word and, and seek the Lord. And you need to not only have a time and a place, but a plan. So right now, our, the last two years, our church has done its own Bible reading plan. This year, we're, we're following the McShane Bible reading plan. And I don't have to wake up every morning going, what am I going to read today? I've got a plan, and so I immediately just go to the plan. And there's some consistency that begins to develop there in your life. And so I want to encourage you to cultivate your devotional life with God. Have a time, have a place, have a plan, and then enter that time in prayer. Focus on the Scripture. Listen to God. Respond to God in prayer. Confess your sins to God. Uh, receive the assurance of His pardon in Christ. Pray for an outpouring of His Spirit on your life. Let this be a daily routine and habit of your life. Your heart will be shaped by your habits. You become the kind of people by what you choose to do over and over and over and over again. Don't miss that. You become the kind of person 
The kind of person you are is formed by what you choose to do over and over and over again. If you choose to forgive someone over and over again, you're going to become a forgiving person. And if you choose to get up every morning and the first thing you do is not check your social media feed, but the first thing you do is get into the scripture and meet with God, it starts to shape the kind of person you're becoming. You're becoming a person inclined to fellowship with God, a person desirous of fellowship with God, a person who finds your identity and significance not in retweets or mentions, but in your relationship with God. And so cultivate your relationship with God. Jesus is primarily concerned with our love for him more than our usefulness to him. Here's the second thing I want you to see from the passage. Jesus is secondarily concerned about our love for people, not their usefulness to us. And don't miss this. Jesus is primarily concerned about a relationship with him more than our usefulness to him. And he's secondarily concerned about our love for people, not their usefulness to us. He says, feed my sheep. Basically, Jesus is saying, if you love me, you will love what I love. And so if you love the shepherd, you're going to care for his sheep. And so I want you to tend to them. I want you to care for them. I, I want you to feed them and nourish them. I, I want you to protect them. I want you to, to, he says here, feed, and then he says shepherd or tend or guard his sheep. And so part of ministry is saying that God has called me to care for, to tend to, to feed, to nourish to love and nurture the people and not use the people. And here's the temptation in ministry is to use people to build your ministry instead of using your ministry to build up people. Do you see the difference? I know, I, I, so in 2005, I moved to New York City. We planted a church in the Upper East Side of Manhattan and we started a second congregation down in Union Square. And the great temptation of my life was to always view people in terms of their usefulness to what I was wanting to accomplish. And if you didn't get on board, and if you didn't really like catch the vision, you became a frustration to me. And what, I, what God revealed to me is I was trying to use people to build my ministry instead of using my ministry to build up people. The, 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 the sign here, or the, 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 the challenge here that Jesus gives people, or Peter, is if you love me, you will not use people to increase your sense of significance and worth and success and value, but you will actually lay your life down for the good of my people. Feed my sheep. Uh, one, of the, one of the temptations as ministry leaders is to focus more on the sheep pen than we, fo than we do focus on the sheep. Right? So we can talk about style and look and facilities and um, all of these things. And like making sure that our, our vision's clear and making sure that our branding is good and making sure that our presentation looks sharp. And if we're not careful, we can focus on the sheep pen. How, how's it? Is it neat? Is it clean? Is it orderly? Versus the sheep that we're actually called to love and serve. I, I'm, I'm really challenged by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2. Um, go ahead and turn there. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, Paul wasn't with this church very long. Remember, he planted the church, and then he was driven out of the city by persecution and had to leave this young church in the hands of some pretty young, underdeveloped leaders. But listen to, listen to what he says about them in verse, I believe it's verse 6. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says in verse 4, um, that we had been approved by God and trusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please people, but rather God who examines our hearts. For we never used flattering speech, as you know, or had greedy motives. God is our witness. Now, as he says, we didn't seek glory from people. Um, here's the, here's what, what Jesus is getting at. We don't seek glory from people. We seek glory for people, right? We want to see them transformed in the image of we want to see them step into all that God wants for them and dreams for them. We're not trying to get things from them. We want things for them. Because we didn't try to seek glory from people, either from you or from others, although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles. Instead, we were gentle among you as a nurse nurtures her own children. Some translations, as a nursing mother gently cares for her children. 
We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel, but also our own lives. You'd become dear to us. You, you, you remember our labor and hardship, brothers and sisters, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preached God's gospel to you. We are, you are witnesses, and so is God of how devoutly, righteously, blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. And you know, like a father, his own children, we encouraged and comforted and implored you. Each one of you lived worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and to the Lord. He said, look, we didn't give you the gospel only. We gave you our life. You became dear to us. You were like a nursing mother and exhorting father. You meant the world to us. You, you see how he loves the people. He wasn't using the people to build his ministry. He was laying his life down to build up these people. That's at the heart of ministry. Let me give you a couple signs that you've put people's usefulness um, as primary. Here's some signs that you've begun to see people as a resource in your ministry and not the recipient of your ministry. You have a tendency to criticize more than celebrate. Um, I remember when I took um, took the role of lead pastor of the church I'm currently in, it was a church that, that just didn't look like the church I felt called to pastor. And so I came in, and there's a lot of stuff I saw that was wrong with it. And one of my great temptations was just to criticize what had happened at this church and to criticize its, its ministries. And when you do that, when you begin to criticize more than you celebrate, when you can see everything that's wrong and are blind to all the evidences of grace, then what, what, you're, what you're manifesting is a frustration with people instead of an appreciation for God's work in the lives of people. And so I want to encourage you to look for evidences of grace. Instead of being frustrated with and criticizing what, what you're seeing among the people you're leading, now, yes, we need to aspire to things for them. We need to discern where growth needs to happen. But we need to primarily look for evidences of grace and celebrate those things. And here's the second thing. I know that I'm seeing people as a resource for ministry instead of a recipient of ministry when I start favoring gifted people. You really have to guard yourself on this. We have Now listen, I believe that you should invest in leaders who have great potential, but not the neglect of feeding the other sheep. And if I'm just constantly drifting to the gifted, constantly drifting to people that are like me and can help me, then I've probably begun to put people's usefulness to me, right, before my love for them. Does that make sense? So I caution you against that. So, so, so Jesus says to Peter, if you love me, if you love me, you're going to feed my sheep. Here's what I want you to do. So primarily, we're, Jesus is concerned about our love for him, not our usefulness to him. And secondarily, he's concerned about our love for people and not their usefulness to us. Now, let me just close with a couple, couple other things. Your love is always going to be tested. Notice how he tells Peter, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, he told him, follow me. Here's what he says to him. Peter, loving me and loving people is going to cost you dearly. It's going to take you to places you never thought you would go. It's going to take you to some places you don't really want to go. And it's going to lead you to do some things you never thought you could do. But if you truly love Jesus and you truly love people, then you're going to end up in some places that you just didn't dream about. Places of sacrifice, places of cost, places of risk places of loss, but also places that are exciting, places that are challenging, places that are life-giving. And so loving people will take you to some places you didn't really want to go and you never thought you could go. And this is what's going to happen to Peter. His love for Jesus and his love for people led him into risk and cost and loss and sacrifice and also into fullness of joy. So we need to be real about love. It's not all walking through roses. Sometimes love leads you into some really hard and painful things. And then here's the last thing. If you're going to love like this, love for Jesus and love for others, here's the beautiful thing. One of the fruits of it 
is it's going to free you from the prison of comparison. Because you're just focused. I'm focused on loving Jesus. I'm focused on loving others. I'm not focused on being as successful as that ministry or that ministry or looking like that ministry. I have found in my own life that when I start to compare my ministry, my gift, my usefulness, when I start comparing myself to other people, here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that it's never fruitful in my life, but always leads to frustration in my life. Notice what happens when Jesus says this to Peter. Peter goes, what about that guy? And Jesus says, if I want him to remain alive until I come, what's that to you? Here's what you need to do. You need to follow me. Don't look around at other people and wonder, is God going to do in me what he's doing in them? Don't, don't worry about that. What you need to do is focus on following Jesus and fulfilling his vision for your life. Here's what I've discovered. That if you compare yourself to other people, you will never truly know who you are. You won't you want acknowledge your own gifts, your own callings, your own abilities. You won't really know who you are. You will just know who you aren't. And you will hate yourself for who you aren't. And if you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. You will be so frustrated with your lack, with your lack of gifts or abilities, and you won't really, just, you won't really know who you are and walk in the freedom of who you are. Just know who you aren't, and then you'll hate yourself for who you are. He's calling Peter here not to have roaming eyes, but just stay focused. Love Jesus, love people. Ministry envy is you despising how God made you and questioning where God placed you. Instead, just be content, be faithful. Love Jesus and love people. And that's the motive for ministry. Love Jesus, love people, and find something else to do, right? If we're going to serve Jesus and his purposes... This is what moves and drives us. We want to love people, love Jesus. We want to love people. Well, let me pray for us, and then I think you guys are going to break up into some groups and have some discussion. And uh, hopefully that will be fruitful. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the way you've made us. Thank you for the gifts that you've poured into us, the personalities that you've given us, the callings you've placed upon us. And most of all, thank you. Thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you for giving your son for us, Father. Thank you for giving us to your son. Grant that we would love him. Grant that we would love the people that he's called us to. Father, where we are out of order in those areas, where our love for you is weak, where our love for your Son is weak, pray that you would cause us to abound in love still more and more. Where we experience more frustration than we do love towards your people, pray that you might forgive us and you might Renew us in our love for your people. You would help us to see your people the way you see them, as people for whom Christ died. Pray that you would break our hearts for where your people are. And give us the grace to lay our lives down, to bring them further along. Give us the grace to cultivate our devotional life with you, to know you and love you, listen to you and follow me. We pray all this in Jesus.